Uh, if you'll pay close attention to a video about our Lottie Moon Easter, Lottie Moon Easter, wow, I'm mixing all that up, Lottie Moon Christmas offering this morning. We're Zach and Hannah Welch, and along with our three children, we're your IMB missionaries to Ivory Coast, West Africa. In the United States, I was an attorney, as well as a bivocational pastor at a small Southern Baptist church in Tallapoosa, Georgia. In many ways, our life has translated well to West Africa as I manage the entities and properties of our mission here, as well as help missionaries find housing, find vehicles, helping keep our missionaries on the ground. I also work with churches as I preach several times a month and disciple people who disciple more people. Since I was a teacher in the States, I have continued to use those gifts and abilities that the Lord has given me here in the Ivory Coast through homeschooling our children and teaching women in the local church. Thank you for your giving to the cooperative program and to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, which gives us a presence here in the Ivory Coast. All right, let's stand together and let's worship the Savior that our missionaries are telling about and that we should be telling about this Christmas season. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story child who has come and has come for a very specific reason. You may be seated at this time. We're going to celebrate the reason Christ came, and that is for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
And so I'm going to turn the service over to our pastor and uh, let Corey lead us in a celebration of baptism this morning. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Always a great day as part of our worship time. We get to observe the ordinance of baptism this morning. I'm excited to have with me Olivia Barnes. Olivia came to me after church a few weeks ago and uh, said, Pastor, can I, can I talk to you about being a Christian? So we sat in the very back and we walked through what the Bible says about our need to confess our sins before the Lord, to repent of our sins, and to place our faith in Jesus. And right then and there, Olivia did that. And so this morning, she comes to profess through the waters of baptism her faith in Jesus Christ. So would you help me welcome Olivia to the baptismal court? Olivia, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And you've placed your faith in him and him alone that declaration, it is my honor and my privilege to baptize you in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. songs, God, may our affection be toward Christ and what all he's done for us. Lord, may we walk out this morning with a realization that uh, no matter what we are called to do in, the, in our going, because of Christ's coming, uh, we have hope and we have all that we need to accomplish all that God's called us to. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me add my words of welcome to you this morning. It's certainly glad to have you with us. If you're a first-time guest or it's been a first time in a long time, we're certainly glad that you're here. You'll notice the Connect cards on the chair in front of you. Just take a moment, fill that out. You can drop in the offering plate when it comes by a little later in the service, or uh, you can stop by our welcome booth in the back of the sanctuary at the end of the service today just so we can have a record of your attendance and certainly get to know you a little better and share with you how the Lord is working here in and among us at North Lake. Well, this morning, we're going to continue our, our time of worship by singing songs about the angels. And uh, there's a lot of folks who debate, you know, and did the angels sing, did they not? The Bible doesn't specifically tell us that the angels sang. But we are not going to make that anything into more than the fact that we're here to celebrate this morning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to celebrate. And sometimes when we celebrate, we tend to just sing out. We tend to just celebrate uh, with our voice. I have seen many of you, whether you know it or not, on the roads, on the highways, celebrating whatever it is you're singing to in your vehicle. You're singing as loud as you can, and I've seen that. Uh, I do the same thing. You've probably caught me doing the same thing, too. But this morning, I want us to stand together, and let's start by singing Angels We Have Heard on High. Let's sing together this morning. Oh, yeah. 
as we uh, spend some time in prayer, um, I want to again focus on our international missionaries. Uh, as we again are in the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering season, where we focus on the men and women who have felt the call of the Lord to go and serve in hard to reach places. And in particular, this morning, I want us to, to focus in on praying for those who are in those places that are not easily accessible, both geographically or politically, to the gospel. Uh, we have so many places in this world that our IMB missionaries are serving, and many of them are serving not under the title of missionary, but under the title of teacher or business person or a farmer or any number of things that are an asset to that community while also using that platform to share the hope of Jesus. And so this morning, would you join me in praying uh, for our IMB missionaries? Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we know that uh, part of what we do as a church, as Southern Baptist, is we give to support the missionaries that we call, uh, that you call, and that we commission and send out. And God, while the giving is a very important part, Lord, the prayer that we can lift for these missionaries is even more vital. So this morning, Father, we know that, the, that you have called men and women, families, to serve in hard, reach, hard to reach places, places that it is dangerous for them to share the gospel. It is life-threatening for them to share the gospel. But Lord, they have counted the cost and said, you know what? We will go, we will share if it even costs us our life. That we, we believe in the message of the gospel so much that the world needs to hear the hope of Jesus Christ so much that we will put our lives on the line. And so this morning I pray for those missionaries who find themselves in those countries. I pray that if any of them are in the midst of discouragement, perhaps they're just, there's not been much fruit to their labor. But this morning, some way, somehow, you would give them encouragement that the spirit that lives inside of them would remind them of the hope of Jesus Christ. That perhaps if they read the Christmas story, even themselves, they look upon it and realize that they too were in need of a Savior. And that whether they grew up in a church like ours or you found them in a far off place, you still called them to yourself. And God, may that be the motivating factor for them to today go out and share the hope of Jesus with one more person. For our IME missionaries who are in places where the gospel is a lot more accessible and Father, where they will be hosting church services today and prayer walks around villages or whatever may be going on, we pray for them as well. We pray for the new crop of missionaries who just recently were confirmed and are being prepared in the first of the year to ship off to their new assignments. We ask as they spend perhaps one last Christmas for a very long time with their family and friends, that God, this season will be one of pure joy and happiness. And that God, the anticipation in their hearts to be on the mission field would not grow waning, would not wane, but Lord, would be intensified all the more. God, thank you for a church who is generous to give. God, as we continue to give toward Lottie Moon and other missions opportunities, uh, God, may we re be reminded that our going, whether it's we physically go or the giving that we give for the going to happen is all because of your coming. That this season of Christmas is what motivates us to go and to make disciples of all nations. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.
you get your Bibles, join with me in Acts chapter 16, and we'll get there here in a few moments. Uh, but uh, I'm excited this morning to have uh, my friend Keith Wade with us. Keith is the uh, director of uh, Collegiate Ministries, Baptist Collegiate Ministries, up the road at University of North Georgia. So Keith, come on, come on up. Let's give Keith a, a welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. So I asked Keith to come this morning because as we as I put this series together, knowing we would spend part of it looking at the incarnation of Christ and then part of it looking at our going with a missions emphasis, I wanted to make sure that I gave Keith some time to talk about missions around us. And really, I want us to understand a, few, a very important thing is that for so long we have talked about, you know, Lottie Moon is for missions and we send people out and we do. But we live in a day and an age where the nations have come to us. And so uh, our ability to reach international, the international population uh, is a lot easier in some respects because internationals are coming here both for work and for school. Uh, and so I know in my 18 years in New Orleans, I had a chance to, to see lots of international students come to faith in Christ and grow in their faith and then take that faith home, many of them, to countries that we cannot easily get missionaries into. Uh, and I'll share some stories about that here in a few moments. But, but Keith, tell the church, how long have you been in collegiate ministry, and then how long in particular have you been at North Georgia? I've, yes, thank you. I wanted to say thank you to North Lake for all that you do in supporting the cooperative program, because it allows me to do what I've been able to do for almost 14 years. Um, and nine of those years, I've almost been at University of North Georgia. And so prior to coming to North Georgia, I was at Truett McConnell College um, there before making the move to University of North Georgia about nine years ago. So cool. Awesome. So the college campus, in my opinion, is one of the greatest mission fields that any church can engage in. So tell the church a little bit about how your BCM is uh, making disciples who make disciples at North Georgia. We are, um, several years ago, um, I was sitting around with our leaders, and our leaders kept saying to me, we got to be more on campus. I mean, they say it every year. So I finally just said to them, you're on campus every week. Now, what are you going to do? And so they took that to challenge to, to heart. So we are on campus every week sharing the gospel with students that we encounter. That may be through asking a silly question. That may be asking, how can we pray for you? That could be through worldview surveys, um, which we partner with the Great Exchange, or that could just be students just talking to their peers in the gym or in their classes. Um, but we intentionally make evangelism a priority. And from that, if a student comes to know Christ, we try to get them connected in a small group as fast as possible, whether it's with us or with a local church. We feel that that's where students will grow the quickest in their walk with Christ is being with a smaller group of people instead of our large ministry that we have on a Monday night. But we try to get them plugged into a small group as fast as possible, which is through one of, like I said, our hawk's nests is our small groups or with the local church. So. Very cool. So one of the aspects I mentioned earlier is that international students come to college campuses and lots of them come from, camp, from countries that are what we call closed countries. Yep. Uh, how have you, or maybe other BCMs in, in the state of Georgia, how have you made it a point to reach out to try to share the gospel with international students, and, and how has that worked for you guys? For us, um, since North Georgia doesn't really have a ton of international students, we try to connect with our International Student Affairs Office. It's changed names. I can't keep up with it. Um, but we try to reach out to them as early as often as we can to see how can we help serve them. And so this past, before the Thanksgiving break, we did an international dinner. Um, and so we, like I said, we make a flyer, we send it to them, and they send it out to the international students on campus. So we had about 20 international students come. And so, um, and then out of that, one of our students gave his life to Christ. Um, from a country that is disclosed. And so, but what, oftentimes what students will come to North Georgia as an international, they're here for a semester or they transfer out to another school or they transfer to go back home. So we try as early as we possibly can to get connected with as many as we can. 
as, and do things as often as we can, but it's not always easy because the international office has a tight hold on it. And so, and we tried to work around as much as possible, but that's just at University of North Georgia. But all across the state, our BCM Campus Ministries does a lot with international students. Because like Corey said, the world is here, especially in the Atlanta area. Um, Georgia State has probably the largest international student population next to Georgia Tech. And so because it's right there, they have the infrastructure, so they do as much as they can to reach international students, whether it's through events geared towards international students or just by meeting them out on campus. And so that is a high priority for not only for all of us, but to reach the nation as they come here. Um, and so not even an hour from here, about an hour and 15 from here, we send students to Clarkston which is where the largest refugees come to Georgia and they kind of house in Clarkston. So we have had students go down there just to meet refugees, to minister to them, share Jesus with them. And so, um, because some of them, they have family back home, but they will probably never get to go back home because they came here under a refugee status or seeking asylum or all this other stuff, but they have family that they regularly, if they come to know Christ, they will share, hey, listen to this. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so we try to heavily pour into international as much as we possibly can. And so. Cool. One last question for you. Um, as you've entered a period of rest, which I always enjoyed this time of the year, <laughs> you get to kind of just slow down for a few weeks, but January will be here before you know it. How can Northlake be praying for you and for the North Georgia BCM as you prepare to start a new semester in January? Um, yeah, that's, I've, as I read that question, I was thinking, thinking, well, first pray that I will just be present with my family during this time, because it is often easy to look ahead to plan for what is about to be around the corner. But I want to be present with, with my family during this Christmas season. But also I want to be mindful of, I know that January 13th is here before I know it. And that's when we start our school um, first day back from the spring semester. Pray for us. We have two mission trips that we will be taking during spring break, and we will be in the planning stages of those starting January the 13th. Um, and so one is we're taking a group to Peru, Lima, Peru, and then we'll have another group that will do DR um, in the Carolinas. Um, we're, we're praying and we're see, seeking to where that may be, whether South Carolina or North Carolina. Um, but pray that as we prepare, that God will prepare us to not only prepare to do missions there, but we will do it here. Um, but also pray that we will continue to be a light on our campus, that we would reach students with the gospel. There's still a lot of work to do, um, and we still have a lot, to, to, a lot of students that still needs to hear about Jesus. And we want to be a difference maker, and we want to be the light and to share that on our campus. Amen. So. Awesome. Let me pray for you before I have you sit down. God, I thank you for my friend Keith. I thank you for the work that he and his team is doing. I thank you for the long, rich legacy of BCM at the University of North Georgia. God, I ask that you would give Keith a, a period of rest during this time. May he find rest for his mind, rest for his body, rest for his soul. May his family be enriched because he is home more during these next few weeks. But God, as January 13th does approach, God, would you burden his heart? Would you allow him, God, all of the... Um, the, the wisdom that he needs to plan well when it comes to both the mission trips, their outreach events, uh, and just the weekly gatherings that they have both as a corporate body and in their small groups. God, thank you for BCM. Thank you for calling men and women to lead BCMs. And God, I know that for my own life, it was instrumental as a college student and then serving as a director, but also God, knowing that, uh, Lord, they are the front lines of ministry of missions on college campuses. And God, may our church and all of our Georgia Baptist churches continue to be um, faithful and, uh, and generous supporters of, of BCM ministry, knowing that uh, we're in this together. We cooperate together for the sake of the kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. I mentioned uh, I had a few stories. I'll tell you one. Uh, we had a young man come in our BCM building named Armstrong. And Armstrong was this tall, good-looking Chinese young man. And he came in and he had heard that, like a lot of BCMs, we provided free food. So that's always a plus for college students. And, um, and so he came to our dinner one night and 
begin to share the gospel with him. And, and Armstrong's initial reaction was this. Hey, listen, I know all about your Jesus. My grandmother helps lead what you guys call an underground church in China, but I don't want anything to do with it. Okay? So Armstrong kept coming. He kept coming to dinner. He'd even stay for worship. He'd come to other events. And he was constantly being shared the gospel in one way, shape, or form by our students. By the time that school year ended, Armstrong was preparing to go back to China. He gave his life to Christ. And our last night of worship, he comes up to me before we start. He says, Corey, can I address the people? And that always scares me. Uh, you just don't know what they're going to say. I'm like, Armstrong, what do, you, what do you want to tell everybody? I just, I just need to tell them thank you. And I was like, okay. So he gets up there and he begins to, to share his thankfulness to how people embraced him and loved him and cared for him and how I fed him and all these things, on and on and on. But then the last thing he said was this. I'm going to go back home and help my grandmother with the church and so that others in my country can hear about Jesus. Folks, I want you to understand that we have a wonderful, incredible partnership through our cooperative giving with not only the North Georgia BCM, but in particular that one because it's right up the road, but all of our BCMs here in the state of Georgia and how we are funding that through our cooperative program giving. And there are tens of thousands of students every year who give their life to Christ because of faithful Southern Baptist churches like ours to give. And so uh, we will continue to be an avid support of missions because the mission field, whether it's North Georgia, whether it's our neighborhood, whether it's some country across the world, is fueled by the coming of Christ. And so as we go and make disciples of all nations, whether we're making them in the nations or we're making them in our own nation and neighborhood, our responsibility is to be obedient to God's calling for us to go. So we go to Acts chapter 16 this morning, and uh, we're going to begin in verse 16, and we're going to read uh, two different sections here, but we'll start off at verse 16 and read to verse 24. Once as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed, turning to the Spirit, and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, These men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are, are, and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in and attacked against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, then they threw them in jail and ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them in the innermost prison and secured their feet in the stocks. Well, when I lead students on mission trips, when I lead teams on mission trips, the one thing they will hear me talk about is, I don't want you to be flexible. I want you to be fluid. There are so many unknowns that will happen on a mission trip. There are so many things that you can't expect or you can't plan for, and that when those things happen, you have to make a decision. Either you give up or you work around it. And so you, most of the time, work around it. You find ways to get the job done, to accomplish the mission of why you were there, 
and you work around the obstacles that might be there for you. My first ever international mission trip was to Jamaica. I was a college student. We sent a team to Jamaica. I was part of the team, and, and we, we, um, I was the preacher for the week. And so we get to the, the prepare to go to the first church that we're going to do uh, revival services at. And so I've got my notes. I've got my Bible. I'm excited. Now, understand, I grew up in Louisiana. Uh, and like many of you, when we talked about going to church, we talked about a building, right, that we went to. Uh, and, and, and whether it was a nice building or a very average building, it was a building. It had electricity. It had running water. It had all the, the basic what we amenities that we would come to expect about church. And so we drive from the coast of Jamaica where we're staying at up into the mountains. We pull in this little dirt road and I see this small house on a hill and we stop at the bottom of the hill and there's this kind of very basic pavilion, uh, you know, wooden posts with tin roof on it. And uh, I asked, I said, why are we stopping here? They said, this is the church. Oh, so we get out and we're kind of walking around and literally there are no chairs. There is literally just this pavilion. And it's about six o'clock in the evening. We're going to start at seven and uh, it's still daylight. So I'm like, okay, it's fine. I can still see my Bible. We're good. I'll have to figure out where I'm going to put my Bible at. There's no podium. There's no, no pulpit, nothing like that. But then as we get closer to seven o'clock, two things begin to happen. One, people begin to ask, hey, where's the bathroom at? Like, oh, it's over there. And they pointed out into the field where they had this kind of, kind of latrine that they had created for us to go use the bathroom in if we needed it. And uh, I'm like, I'm good. I can hold it. Um, others were not so good, and so they made do with it. But then as they got closer to 7 o'clock, I began to notice that there was, the light was dimming more and more. So I asked the question. I said, how, how am I supposed to see my Bible to read and to preach? Oh, pastor, we got it. And they ran, I don't know, a 200-yard, felt like 200-foot, 200-yard um, extension cord from that house and put a drop light. You know, the one you'd hang on your car, the one your dad would make you hold and then fuss at you because you weren't holding it the right way when he was working on the car. And that was the light. Before I knew it, I began to watch that little pavilion be full of 40, 50, 60 Jamaican residents come to hear the gospel. Nobody drove, everybody walked. And they would walk back after two hours of being there, of singing and of preaching and of puppet ministry and everything else we did. Two hours later, they just walked back home. You had to be fluid. You had to trust that what God was going to, had brought you there to do, he was going to give you everything you needed to do, and you had to be fluid when it came to the circumstances on the ground. So we look at Paul. Paul is beginning his second missionary journey here, and he's going through the streets, and he's sharing the gospel, but he's got, he's got his own PR person there. <clears throat> this slave girl keeps coming behind him, <clears throat> and he keeps, they keep, she keeps yelling out that, hey, this is... This man, they're, they're telling you about this important person. He, he, she's, she's, they're proclaiming the way of salvation, and these men are the servants of the Most High God. Now, you would think that a preacher wouldn't mind a little help, that you would think that Paul and Silas wouldn't mind this young girl going with them and kind of echoing the message that they were given, but the Scriptures say what? That Paul eventually got annoyed with the Spirit. Notice he didn't get annoyed with the girl. He knew the girl was a slave. She was both a slave to the people who had, who had ownership of her physically, but she was a slave also to this demon. And so he looks around, eventually he turns back to her, and he says, in Jesus' name, demon, get out. And immediately the demon left. Now, you would think that because this girl is now healed, that she is no longer possessed by this demon, that, that, the, that the crowd would be just ecstatic. They'd be so excited for her, and they would be like, wow, Paul and Silas, tell us more about this Jesus whom you, whom you spoke of, who, who took this demon out of this girl. You would think that, but that wasn't the case. See, very quickly, those who owned this young girl recognized that their ability to make a profit was gone. 
that this young girl, because of the demon living inside of her, was able to foretell certain things. And so they were using her to make money, but all of a sudden their ability to make money had gone away, and so they had no use for her, nor they had any use for Paul and Silas. Their immediate reaction is to grab them and bring them into the marketplace and then bring them to the judges and say, listen, we've got problems. First of all, these men are Jews. And so in a Roman colony, in a Roman area, <clears throat> the Jews were not very highly favored. They were not looked upon. And so the anti-Semitism was very strong. And so they said, listen, these two guys, these two guys are Jews, and that's a problem. Number two, not only that, or they are causing and they're saying things that we Romans, we can't be about. Now, it was true that in Rome, they took seriously religion. In fact, the emperor was so serious about it that most emperors thought of themselves as a god. And so, uh, if you were to bring about a new religion, a new religious thought into the Roman community, you couldn't just go out and talk about it. It had to be investigated. It had to make sure that it wasn't uh, against what Rome had already established as their religious practice. And if it fell under those, under those, those things, then you could begin to worship your God, if you will. But Paul and Silas didn't go through the right authorities. They just went straight to the people and began to share the hope of Christ. And so because of that, though, this girl was set free. And all of a sudden, they found themselves bound. The magistrates looked at them and said, Listen, guys, we're going to have to show you how this is done. And so they stripped them down, whether they stripped them totally naked or stripped them just of their, their top clothing. It doesn't really matter. They stripped them. They had him flawed, and not only flawed, they said, hey, we're going to throw you into prison, but not only prison, we're going to throw you into the deepest and darkest prison. Now, Paul didn't have going to prison on his mission trip prep sheet. When we begin to meet for our Alaska mission trip next, next month and over the, the course of the months leading up to it, one of the things that I'm not going to be looking forward to is saying, hey, listen, let's not go to jail. All right? It's not the plan to go to jail. It wasn't Paul's plan to go to jail. Paul's plan was to share the hope of the gospel, yet here Paul and Silas find themselves in jail. So as we look at your notes this morning, we have the Beatitudes of going. And each one begins with the word be. And so the first one is this, be observant. Don't look to get into trouble, but don't be surprised when trouble comes finding you. See, if, if you are going to be about sharing the gospel, whether you're doing that in your neighborhood or you're doing it in the nations, there are going to be people who are not going to like the message of the gospel. So often we live in our own little Christian echo chamber. We are around church folk all the time. We listen to just Christian radio. We, we, we read just Christian books. We hang around just Christian people. And while all those things are fine and we should do all those things, we can find ourselves in an echo chamber and we don't realize that there are people outside of that who don't love Jesus the way we do. And it's our responsibility as ambassadors, as witnesses, as missionaries called by Christ to share the hope of the gospel, to have what can be at times very difficult and hard conversations. And oftentimes, those difficult and hard conversations come with difficult and hard circumstances that follow. Now, I don't go looking for trouble when I go to share the gospel. But I'm always aware that trouble can come, that Satan will do whatever he can to thwart the expansion of God's kingdom. Now, he, will, he doesn't win. He will not ultimately win. The, the victory has been won in Christ on the cross. But until that day, he is going to do whatever he is allowed to do to hinder the sharing of the gospel. John 15, 18 through 19 says, The world hates you. Understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were, uh, if you were of the world, and the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of it, 
the world hates you. Those are, those are Jesus' words. But listen, that, that as you go and you are an ambassador of Christ, and he's telling the disciples this, and he's telling us this, as you go out and you, you share the hope of Christ, understand the world will hate you. But understand, they hated me well before they hated you. And what they, what they can't stand is they can't stand me in you. They can't stand the fact that you are an obedient follower of Jesus. They can't stand that you have given your life to Christ and that you are doing all that you can to, to, to live for Jesus. That goes against everything our flesh desires. So you're going to find yourself in predicaments where trouble will find you. We'll keep reading in the book of Acts. We'll keep going in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, because we're all here. The jailers called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, and along with everyone in his house. And he took them the same hour of night and washed their wounds. And right away, he and all his family were baptized. And he brought them into this house and set a meal before them and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. The second beatitude of going I want you to see is be a witness no matter where you are or what your circumstances might be. So Paul and Silas are brought to the inmost jail. Their legs are fastened in the stocks. Now, so often we think of stocks and we think of what we saw, you know, in like the westerns and stuff or in medieval movies where they put your hand and your arms in there. Well, these were fixed to your feet and they were up against the wall. They were bolted to the wall so you were literally standing up the entire time. And so if you tried to bend down, it would give excruciating pain to your legs and so you would think that paul and silas would be in that jail and their response would be complaining would be whining would be crying out that wasn't their response paul and silas stood there and what did they begin to do they began to sing hymns to the lord they probably were singing some of the very psalms that we read in the book of psalms they began to what? They began to pray. They began to be a witness of Jesus Christ in the midst of this prison. You see, they could have taken that moment to complain. They could have taken that moment to, to be quiet. They could have taken that moment to do anything but share the hope of Jesus. But yet, they didn't allow their circumstances to get in the way. They made sure that those who were there heard the message of Christ. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, said this, that the legs feel nothing in the stocks when the heart is in heaven. Mm. The legs feel nothing in the stocks when the heart is in heaven. That's why in Christ we have so much hope that the circumstances around us are irrelevant to our salvation that, that the world around us could be literally going up in flames, but in Christ we are content and we have joy. One of the most famous songs that we sing during this time of the year is what? Joy to the world. Joy is not an emotion, it's a state of being. Joy says that regardless of my circumstances, I am content in Christ. It's a state of being. It's who I am. And so I can even have joy in the midst of grief. I can have joy in the midst of righteous anger. 
I can have joy in the midst of celebration and happiness. Because all those emotions are based on the circumstances. But joy is something that is present with us because it's tied, it's anchored to who we are in Christ. You see, light shines the brightest in the darkest places. In the deepest, darkest, dampest, dungiest dungeon, Paul and Silas lit up the room. And while prisoners remained shackled in their shell shells, while the jailer remained on watch, they sang. They prayed. Having no idea what God was about to do, not even anticipating that God would rescue them, they really didn't care. They were going to be obedient. Perhaps if this song was written at the time, they would have sang these verses. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. All around my soul gives way. He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. While Paul and Silas didn't have those words, you and I do. We can sing some of the great hymns and songs of both the past and current. We can open the scriptures and we can speak out and pray out God's word. We have all of that at our disposal. We can count it all joy. But number two, be on the lookout. Number three, I should say, be on the lookout for God's supernatural work around you. They're singing. They're praying, and all of a sudden, this giant, this massive earthquake hits. <clears throat> the earthquake showed the power of God to deliver, but it also showed that God heard the prayers of Paul and Silas. See, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing, but they were also looking to see what God was going to do. I think so often we forget to look for God to show up. We may be praying about things, we may be earnestly seeking things, but we don't have our eyes open for God to show up and to reveal Himself. See, God sometimes shows up in the earthquake, and other times He shows up in the whisper. What's important isn't how He shows up, but that He shows up. And so in that moment, what needed to happen was that earthquake needed to be so large and so incredibly powerful that it threw open the doors to the cells. And it rumbled so heavily, the shackles that were tightly around the legs of Paul and Silas, and every other prisoner in that cell fell down. When is the last time you looked for God's work around you? When is the last time after you got done praying, you became observant? All right, Lord, I'm not just going to pray. I'm going to see where you're at work around me, and I'm going to join you there. You see, we cannot follow the Lord. We can't be obedient if we're not joining him where he's at work. Paul and Silas were ready to join Jesus. Whether that meant their death or it meant some miracle upon miracle of them being released. Either way, they were ready to meet Jesus and were going to join him in the work and he was going to make sure that they, that those around them heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Number four, be ready to share the hope of Christ when the opportunity presents itself. The jailer runs in with a torch he brings them out, perhaps even to his home, which would have been right there next to the jail. And he looked at these two men and he said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Be ready to share the hope of Christ when the opportunity presents itself. Let me ask you a question. Someone came up to you today and said, sir, madam, you're a Christian. What must I do to be saved? What would you tell them? What would you, what would you walk them through? What scriptures could you point them to to show them the gospel truth? 
I'm old school. I've been around. I've seen a lot of different evangelism techniques. I am still an old school Roman road guy. Because to me, it's the most easy way to walk somebody through how to be saved. And so if, if you're unfamiliar, I encourage you to follow along with me in your Bible. And, and if you don't have a highlighter with you, I encourage you to go back this afternoon and either highlight these or underline them so that you can easily find them. And, but more importantly, I encourage you to memorize them. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether you've sinned a millimeter or you've sinned a mile, whether you missed the mark by a little or a lot, it doesn't really matter. You've missed the mark. The Bible declares that all of us have missed the mark, and so all of us have fallen short of God's expectation of perfection. So there's not a one person, whether you grew up in a Christian home or whether you have done everything immoral, illegal, unethical under the sun, you're still in need of a Savior because you have missed the mark. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. The wage, what we deserve is death. Wage is not a gift. For those of you who are still working and when payday comes around, your boss doesn't tell you, hey, I've got a gift for you and hands you your payroll check. It's not a gift. I've earned that. I've put my time in. I've done the work. I deserve that paycheck. The Bible says what you and I deserve is God's wrath and his death. But that verse also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. But there is a gift involved that, that we don't have to be succumb to the wages of what we deserve, but there is a gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is good news that there's no hoops that I have to jump through. There's, I don't have to get myself together for God to approve me. That in Christ, if he opens my eyes and he draws me to the table, he draws me to his family, he demonstrates his love toward me, regardless of my sinful condition. The Romans 10.10 10 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. If you were in the Wednesday night group this past Wednesday, you heard me talk a little bit about this. In a Roman culture, it was the title was Caesar is Lord. So for someone to profess that Jesus is Lord, especially in a Roman context, was to tell the government, I don't need you. That I don't believe that Caesar is Lord, that I truly believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that is, there is not a stronger profession of faith than that. Many of the international students that Keith and I have had a chance to, to share the gospel with, many of them, this is one of the toughest things because for them to say yes to Jesus means to say no to their family. It may mean that they will never go back home because to do so, they'll be an outcast at the very least. And at the worst, they could be target for murder, execution, for saying Jesus is Lord. But yet we're called to make Jesus Lord. We're called to declare that he is Lord of our life. And then Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone whom God opens their eyes, everyone man, boy, woman, child, whom God opens their eyes will declare that Jesus is Lord and salvation will be brought to them. But finally, we have be anticipating God to work in mysterious and unusual ways. Be anticipating God to work in mysterious and unusual ways. The miracle of the earthquake wasn't to deliver Paul and Silas from their physical chains, but to deliver the jailer and his entire family from their spiritual chains. The jailer would have never heard the hope of Jesus if Paul and Silas were never put in jail. And some of you may be wondering, Pastor, why, why am I allowed to go through some of the suffering that I'm going through? Maybe just maybe he has you in that hospital room. 
Maybe he just, maybe he has you in front of someone that if you were not in a place of suffering, that there would not be an opportunity to share the hope of Jesus. Paul and Silas had no idea on that day that they would be in prison. But they made sure that they took the best of the opportunity they had to live for Christ. Because their going was informed and fueled by Christ's coming. You see, Paul and Silas went from being prisoners to being brothers in Christ with the jailer. In a matter of moments, they went from being the scum underneath his boots to being brothers in Christ. From being in the deepest, darkest dungeon to being in his living room, having their wounds cleaned and a fresh hot meal but before them. He and his family in a moment went from being on their way to hell to hearing the gospel and responding and being and giving their life to Christ and being baptized on their way to heaven. All because Paul and Silas were willing to be obedient to Jesus. A missionary on furlough told the following true story while visiting his home church in Michigan. While serving at a small field hospital in Africa every two weeks, I traveled by bicycle through the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. This was a two-day journey and required overnight camping at the halfway point. On one of those journeys, I arrived in the city where I planned to collect money from a bank, purchase medicine and supplies, and then begin my two-day journey back to the field hospital. Upon arrival in the city, I observed two men fighting, one of whom had been seriously injured. I treated him for his injuries and at the same time talked to him about the Lord. But I then traveled two days camping overnight and arrived at home without incident. Two weeks later, I repeated my journey. Upon arriving in the city, I was approached by the young man I had treated. He told me that he had known I had carried money and medicines. He said, some friends and I followed you into the jungle knowing that you would camp overnight. We planned to kill you and take your money and the drugs. But just as we were about to move into your camp, we saw that 26 armed guards surrounded you. At this, I laughed and I said I was certainly all alone in the jungle campsite. The young man pressed the point, however, and said, No, sir, I was not the only person to see the guards. My friends also saw them, and we all counted them. It was because of those guards we were afraid and left you alone. At this point in the sermon, one of the men in the congregation jumped to his feet and interrupted the missionary and asked if he could tell him the exact day that this happened. The missionary told the congregation the date, and the man who interrupted told him this story. On the night of your incident in Africa, I was, it was the morning here, and I was preparing to go play golf. I was about to putt when I felt the urge to pray for you. In fact, the urging of the Lord was so strong, I called some men in the church to meet with me here in the sanctuary to pray for you. But all those men who met with me on that day stand up. The men who met together to pray that day stood up. The missionary was con wasn't concerned with who they were. He was too busy counting how many men he saw. There were 26 men. Obedience. Whether it's obedient to go or obedient to pray. How are you in your obedience? This morning, perhaps you need to be like Olivia. You need to say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ, but I know this morning that I will die. If I die, I will split hell wide open. And I need to place my faith in Jesus. Maybe you've done that, and what you need to do is you need to find yourself in the baptistry. We're going to baptize again next Sunday. So if you've placed your faith in Christ, but you've never followed through in obedience to that faith <clears throat> by scriptural baptism by immersion, Will you come down and say, Pastor, I need to be baptized? Maybe you've been visiting our church for a while and you need a place to call your own. You need a place of membership, a church that you will officially be a part of. Will you come down and say, Pastor, I want to I join this church. Maybe there's something else God is calling you to be obedient about. Will you be obedient? Will you be obedient? In your going, will you trust that His coming has given you all that you need 
to be obedient to him. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that our obedience would be based off of our trust in Christ. God, whether it's someone who needs to come and give their life to Jesus, be baptized, join the church, whatever it might be, Lord, would you help them to be obedient this morning? Would they have the courage to step forward because of who Jesus is? The hope that secures us in all things. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing. seated if our gentleman will come up to take our offering. Let me give you some, uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, if you look in your bulletin to next Sunday, um, you will see that we're having brunch at 1030. We are not having brunch at 1030. <laughs> Again, like I said last week, if I could afford to feed you every week, I would. Just can't do it. So if you come at 1030 looking for food, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, but so our normal schedule next week, 
Bible study groups at 945 and then worship at 11 for next Sunday. Lots of great things coming up in your bulletin. Make sure you look at those things uh, and uh, as the holidays are approaching. Next Sunday night, uh, Advent service at 6 p.m. Would love to have you come back and join us for a night of focusing on the Advents of Christ, singing, taking the Lord's Supper, uh, and doing it together as a family. So that is next Sunday night. So make sure that you make plans to, to do that. Let me invite Robert and Sean to come on up. Robert Guyton, Sean Guyton. The Guyton family uh, have been visiting with us uh, for a while. This is dad and daughter. This is grandfather and aunt to Olivia, who got baptized. Uh, they come this morning. Uh, amen. <clears throat> they have been active on Sundays and Wednesdays, have just been uh, a part of everything that we have to offer. But this morning they come saying, hey, on our statement of faith and baptism in Jesus Christ, we want to come and be a part of North Lake Baptist Church. Amen, church? Amen. You guys stay up here. Uh, let me get a couple folks from the Pathfinders class, and that's the class they've been going to on Sunday morning. Philip, Jack, the mothers, come on up. Uh, the Brits, there we go. We'll get a whole crew around you guys. Um, and so, um, Chris, anybody else? We just, the whole church want to just come up? And... <laughs> no, it's awesome. Um, so uh, just to give you, a, those of you who may be sitting there like, okay, hey, me, I, I kind of might want to do this membership thing. This is kind of step one, all right? Step, the most important step is January 5th is our next North Lake Connect class where I will sit down with all of our prospective new members and walk you through what we believe and why we believe it and all those good stuff. And so uh, next Sunday in your bulletin, there'll be a, a registration a form for that. So if you've not been through North Lake Connect, uh, we invite you to do that uh, on January 5th. We'll give you more information for that next Sunday. All right. Who's our deacon of the week? Terry? Terry, come on up and close us out in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, what a wonderful day you've given us to worship you, to see you in our presence, to see you uh, represented Jesus Christ in our baptisms. We thank you for Olivia, the sweet soul that you've given and taken uh, 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 in our presence, Lord, so that we can experience the joy of our salvation again. And Lord, as uh, the scriptures today that, sh that uh, uh, Corey shared of Paul and Silas being in prison, the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your whole household. And now we have households walking forward, Lord, want to be a part of seeing men and women and boys and girls grow in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So use this family, bless this family. Pray, I pray for those children and, and all of our children and our children's children, Lord, that you may be glorified because of the faithfulness that you've put in our lives to show them the pathway to righteousness and to holiness through our Savior Jesus Christ. We can't do it on our own, only through Christ and trusting and believing and obeying him shall we uh, receive that salvation. So blessed are we to be called your children today. Let us use this season of Christmas to be the joy of Jesus Christ on all those we meet in the grocery stores and schools and, and our family settings and joyous times, Lord. Let Jesus shine in all of our hearts that we may have a very Jesus-filled Christmas is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.